Okay, ready? Here we go, guys. All right. All right, so I went over the functions of the liver, and I explained to you how bile is made, correct? Yep. Okay, watch. I just want to show you this real quick. One of the big functions of the liver is to make that big plasma blood protein, albumin. Write this down. Never forget it. And this, this goes with almost um, all organs of the body. When an organ fails... All the functions of that organ fail. All of them. You got me? Did I ever tell you about um, Barry McAllister? Did I ever tell you that story? I'm going to tell you now. Listen up because this is true. Barry McAllister was, um, he was a um, Vietnam veteran, right? After he got out of Vietnam, he lived in uh, California. The day he got out, right, and then he moved in with his dad, a week later, he got a, a job at a, in a warehouse with his dad. And Barry worked second shift. His dad worked first shift. And he comes in for his second day of work, and the manager says, hey, I need to talk to you. And he's like, yeah, what? He goes, your dad just committed suicide. Then he got shot three times in Chicago, none of which occurred when he was in Vietnam. Anyways, the guy had some uh, pretty bad luck. He was a heroin addict for a while, and then he started running the warehouse at the company I worked at. So it was a week before the 4th of July, and I don't remember what year, but it was probably, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago. So I don't have to punch in. So he had the big warehouse door open, so I just walked in through the warehouse. And he goes, hey, Tim, can I talk to you? I'm like, sure. And he goes, look. And he says, I got these blood blisters, and I pop them, blood spurtulates out, and then I can't stop them bleeding. And I'm like, that ain't right. <laughs> so I said, let me check your blood. So what was I looking for? I was looking at his liver because he also liked to booze it. Right? So I check his liver enzymes. That was on a Friday. Monday, I get the liver enzyme results back. And this is not some information you give somebody over the phone. I drove down to Chicago and I said, You got a doctor? And he goes, Do I need one? I'm like, You need one. So he was a, I uh, got him hooked up with the VA, right? He had hepatitis C from the needles. And then he was drinking, and I said, I don't say this to people unless I know it's for real. I go, you take one more drink. It literally could be your last. And he goes, Tim, I just bought a 30-pack for, of Old Style for um, the 4th of July. And I said, my liver's good. <laughs> so I'm not even kidding that Friday. I dropped him off at his house, and he gave me the 30-pack. <laughs> I'm not letting that go to waste. Anyways, uh, Got hepatitis C, got an interferon, and was straight. And then, like, two years later, he developed, uh, he had a heart attack and died. But, uh, oh, yeah. And then he hurt his back. And I told him, I said, this is years ago. I go, Barry, if you need anything, call me. You got me? So he calls me. I'm driving here to work. And he goes, Tim, remember when you said if I needed anything, I could call you? I said, you got it. What do you need? He goes, I'm off of work, and my disability doesn't kick in for a month. And I'm short on my rent. I go, how much you need? He goes, I need 1500 bucks. I said, you got it, right? So I give it to him. And then before he pays me back, I, he goes, I said to him, I don't want you to pay me back. What I want is the tailor-made R11 driver. If you can get me that, you can buy it online. I don't care. But if you give me that, we're good. He's like, that's all I got to do? I go, yeah. So three weeks later, he died of a heart attack. <laughs> So I never got my driver or my 1500 bucks. That's the story. But here's my point. 
when an organ fails, all the functions of that organ fail. And one of the things that the liver does is it makes blood clotting factors. So he was developing little little blood blisters because his liver was failing. And he had a big gut. That's not a beer belly, right? That's fluid. It's fluid. When you have a, a dude with skinny arms and legs and a big belly, that ain't fat, that's fluid. And the doctor will lay them down and they will push on it and you can see the fluid wave moving back and forth. And if a doctor has time, what they will do is they will fold up a prescription and put a little, make a little boat and not even playing. Watch, watch. Hang on. I think it's here. Here. That's ascites from liver failure. You got me? Look. And they all look the same. They got skinny arms and legs and a big belly. That ain't fat. That's fluid. And you know how this works. Watch. Watch. There's a big freaking protein in your blood that's made by your liver. Albumin. Big Al. Tell me you got that. When your liver fails, all the functions of that organ fail. So you stop making albumin. As a result, now, one of the best dialyzing membranes you have in your body is your peritoneal membrane, this big sac that covers your entire test intestines. What happens, you got stuff in your belly, and now you don't have albumin because the liver ain't making it. So water's going to move from an area of a lot of water and less stuff through a selectively permeable membrane to an area of more stuff and less water. That is the fluid shift that you get when your liver begins to fail because your liver ain't making albumin. Tell me you followed that. Yes or no? That's why they got it. And what they do is they, this, these little things right here, right here, these are the stitches from when they did what's called an abdominal synthesis. They stick a needle in there and they drain off that excess fluid. Also, depending on what the guy liked to drink, they will actually put a tapper of it on there. Like if it was old style, we'll fill it up. <laughs> That's flu and here's the thing. They drain that and the only reason they drain that is so that the person can breathe. As the belly fills up, they can't contract their diaphragm, so they have a hard time breathing. That's going to come back because the liver still ain't making albumin. So watch. These little kids, do they drink? Are they drinking 40s? Or fours? It's called Quashcora, the evil spirit that infects the first child when the second child is born. What don't the second child or the first child get to do anymore after the second child is born? They don't get to breastfeed. And because these kids are poor, the most expensive thing in a grocery store is protein, meat. So these kids don't get a lot of protein, so the liver don't have that amino acids to build albumin, so the same thing happens to them. What you do is you get, take them to Burger King, you get them two Whoppers, two large fries, and a Diet Coke. They now have amino acids. Their liver starts making albumin. They suck the water out of their belly into their bloodstream. They pee like a racehorse for a couple of weeks, and they are straight. The dude with the liver problem because he drank himself to death, it's over for him. But they have skinny arms and legs and a big belly, just like the boozer, and it has everything to do with albumin. Say, yeah, there you have it. Okay, now, wait, one last thing, and then I'm going to move on from the liver. What? Quashcora? Ascites? No, no. Okay, watch. Watch. The liver is the only organ in the body that can regenerate itself. So you can not read the textbook, have a bout with the bottle on a regular... And if you destroy the liver, part of the liver, if you stop destroying it, it will regenerate. But if you destroy 70% of your liver, 
it's officially over for you. You're going to need a liver transplant or you're taking a six-foot dirt nap. Here's the other thing that I think is actually pretty cool. You can donate part of your liver. So if you donate part of your liver, that part will regenerate, and you can donate part of your liver to someone who's smaller than you because the liver will regenerate to accommodate that space in the abdominal cavity. You don't think that's cool? That's insane. That's really insane. So um, if you are jaundice and you got ascites, you are at end-stage liver failure, and you are on your way out. What? It's just bad for you. You don't want that. That's why every day I look in the mirror and make sure that my belly's kind of flat. <laughs> right? That's your liver. Okay, wait. I ain't done. I ain't done. Any pressure in your veins? Is there any pressure in your veins? If you get this right, I'll give you extra credit. Watch. Where does all the blood of the GI tract, the stuff got digested and absorbed in from the GI tract into the venous blood, where does it all go? What's the big vessel that carries all that blood to the liver? The hepatic portal vein. Is there any pressure in the hepatic portal vein? No. So watch. If you don't read the textbook, you drink, smoke, and swear, you will damage your liver. Tell me you got that. Is there any pressure in the hepatic portal vein? No. So if your liver becomes damaged is the same amount of blood from the GI tract trying to go back to the liver. Yes. But if that liver is damaged, will it be able to handle all of that blood? No. So that blood will begin to back up into the liver, and it will be be begin to back up into the hepatic portal vein and the veins of the GI tract. And you learned, and I'll never forget it, and some of you wrote it, it was beautiful. I actually had a tear in just one eye crying when I read it. That there's no pressure in the veins, so the veins have the ability to stretch. So people who got bad livers, they get hemorrhoids. Anyone over the age of 40 who has a bout with the bottle on a regular got hemorrhoids. And how people with liver failure die, one of the big ways, remember that the liver makes blood clotting factors. They will start to bleed in their GI tract, and they can't stop that bleeding, and they bleed to death. GI bleed. And let me tell you, it's the worst. There's nothing worse in the world than GI bleed. They throw up blood, and they crap blood, and you find them dead in a puddle of stinky blood. And just so you know, when you know some, like a GI bleed's coming in, you put some, I don't know, some, what is that, Vicks underneath it because it's nasty. And make faces, it helps. Like, tell me you got that. Um, just real quick, one of the places that the blood backs up into when the person's liver is really jacked up is the esophagus, and they get what's called esophageal varices or ballooning out of veins in the esophagus. So this one guy I had to take care of, he had part of his lung removed, and he had such bad esophageal varices, they removed his esophagus and put his stomach up here. That's no joke. And this guy was... He was going through withdrawals, alcohol and drug withdrawals, as I'm trying to take care of him. And he's like, and I'm like, cut it out, right? So I called the surgeon, and I said, look, this guy's going to tear his stitches. You're going to be taking him back to surgery. I need to paralyze him. And he said, okay, give him some Versed and some Pavulon. Pavulon paralyzes skeletal muscle. So you better make sure he's on a ventilator or you kill him. So you're supposed to give the Versed first, then the Pavulon. I gave the Pavulon first, then the Versed. So he's like this, and then all of a sudden he's like, and the only thing that worked was his eyes, and his eyes are going like this, back and forth, and his heart rate's just going flying, right? And I said, be nice when you wake up, and then I pushed the verse, and then he went to sleep. But that guy was a mess. This is no joke. 
in an eight hour period, I gave him 80 milligrams of morphine IV, and that guy, it didn't touch him. I give you one or two milligrams of morphine IV, you're out for three or four hours. You're drooling. This guy, nothing. Didn't touch him. So don't do that. Otherwise, you get your stomach in your chest. Right? Don't do that. How many people followed that? Okay. That's your liver. I already went over your gallbladder, didn't I? Now I'm going to go over your pancreas. Here we go. Watch. Your pancreas is both an endocrine gland, and an endocrine gland is any gland that releases hormones into the blood. And what are the two hormones that the pancreas releases? Please get this right. And and glucagon, right? And then it's also an exocrine gland. And anything that's dumped into the hole here, right, the alimentary canal is considered exocrine. So the pancreas has several functions in digestion. So watch. Number one, the pancreas releases bicarbonate. What did the stomach form? What did it form to help digest protein? Acid, hydrochloric acid. So the pancreas releases bicarbonate to neutralize that stomach acid. Yeah? And the other thing that the pancreas releases is it releases digestive enzymes. So the pancreas is intimately involved in metabolism and digestion. And I want this whole thing. There's a question on the final about the functions of the pancreas, gallbladder, and liver in digestion. So these are the enzymes that the pancreas releases, right? Boom. Number one, amylase. And amylase helps digest carbs. Number two, lipase. What do you think lipase digests? Come on. Fat. You got that? And then you have, number three, you have trypsin. Can you see that? That's terrible. Trypsin. And chymotrypsin. And what do you think they digest? Well, we got carbs, fats. There you go. Yeah. Do you eat DNA? That's evil. Do you eat DNA? Yes or no? Corp, get this right. Swig off my diet Mountain Dew. And this coffee that's really cold and was here since yesterday. Do you eat DNA? Yes, no. Do you? Who eats DNA? Yeah, if you eat a hanger burger, you're eating DNA, right? Because muscles have a nucleus and the nucleus contains... There you go. So watch, I'm going to teach you something too. So... The pancreas releases these other enzymes called nucleases. What do nucleases digest? DNA. DNA. Tell me you got that. And when you digest DNA, those nucleic acids, which are, of course, you remember, you probably have children named this now, adenine, Guan, you're with me? Yes. Those nucleic acids 
go to the liver because everything that you eat and digest goes to the liver, doesn't it? Yeah, so put that in your pipe and smoke it. Yeah. Does anybody smoke crack here? Just on the weekends? Okay, you're a crack smoker on the weekend. Okay, watch it. When you digest DNA, those nucleic acids go to the liver. And they are broken down, watch it, to uric acid. Uric acid is insoluble in the blood. It forms a crystal in the blood. Look at this. This is scary. Anybody got any money? How much you got? (laughs) Watch. Here's the blood. Here's uric acid. It settles at the bottom. So when you start building up uric acid in the blood, it will start settling out of your blood. And what's the most dependent part of your body? What's the most dependent part of your body? If you don't have Flintstone feet, where all your toes are the same length, what's the... Do you know what I'm talking about? No. I better tell you then. <laughs> the most dependent part of your body is your big toe. So the uric acid precipitates to the most dependent part of your body and starts crystallizing in your big toe, and you get gout. Say yes. So who gets gout? People who are Honey, I want steak and potatoes for supper. They're meat and potatoes, guys, because meat has DNA. And they like drinking beer. Who doesn't? You drink beer, it's got yeast. Yeast got DNA. So that's why people who drink beer and eat meat get gout. Say yeah. So the doctor tells you to decrease your beer intake? No way. I stop eating meat. Mm Mm-hmm. Tell me you got that. And it used to be called the uh, disease of royalty because only rich people could afford meat. Now everybody can, so everybody gets it. So you stop eating the meat and the cow will go away? Yeah. I never get it because if I know I'm drinking beer, I stay away from meat. So I haven't had a burger in like probably 13 years. I hate me too, just so you know. How many people got that? Okay, watch. You have to know a little bit of anatomy. And this is not earth shattering. It will take you about three seconds to remember this. The pancreas is divided into three parts. You have the head of the pancreas, the the body of the pancreas, and then the tail of the pancreas. And when your pancreas ain't working right, your, your pancreas can't wiggle that tail. Now watch. I'm taking you back all to to day number one. Watch. Do different cells do different things? And in order to do those different things, what do they got to have inside them? And different enzymes. Ain't that right? What does the pancreas release? What enzymes? I just told you. Amyl, <laughs> amylase, lipase, say yes. You're with me. If your pancreatic cells are healthy, 
Where should amylase and lipase be? In your pancreatic cell. So watch. I'm going to just go be beautiful. The most common cause of acute pancreatitis is biliary obstruction due to cholelithiasis. Oh, somebody stop me. Those are three big words in a row. Ain't that right, Latrenda? Wasn't it? You see? Whatever. Watch. Some people produce gallstones, and those gallstones are small enough to get through the cystic duct, and they will end up in the common bile duct, and they will get stuck in the hepatopancreatic ampulla. Are you with me? When you eat food, nom, 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 that food in your duodenum is going to stimulate the pancreas to release its digestive enzymes. Where are those digestive enzymes that the pancreatic cells release? Where are they supposed to go? Where are they supposed to go? Into the duodenum to digest your food. But what's blocking the little hole? A gallstone. So those pancreatic enzymes remain in your pancreas and do their job. They digest carbs, fats, and protein. And what is your pancreas made out of? I'll tell you. Carbs, fats, and protein. So pancreatitis is your own pancreatic enzymes digesting your pancreas. Yeah. Now, watch. Watch. What caused the pancreas to release its digestive enzymes? Food in the duodenum. So if you have a person with pancreatitis, do you want food in their duodenum? No. So they can't eat and they got to have a little tube stuck down there and suck out anything that's in their stomach. Because if it goes from their stomach into their duodenum, it will cause the pancreas to release digestive enzymes. Do you know anybody who's ever had acute pancreatitis? Do you? Go find someone for extra credit. Ask in the hall. Hold a sign out there. <laughs> Tell me you got that. How many people followed that? Yes or no? So, now, look, look. Do you ever get a gallstone here? Where do you get a gallstone? Here. So, where is the most likely part of the pancreas to get damage from pancreatitis? The feet? What's this called? The, the head of the pancreas. So the most common, watch, the number one risk factor for the development of pancreatic cancer is bouts of pancreatitis. And the most common place to develop pancreatic cancer is in the head of the pancreas because that's the area that's damaged most. Tell me you got that. Yes or no? Now, <clears throat> there's chronic pancreatitis, and that is from alcohol. People who drink regularly, alcohol will actually punch holes in the pancreatic duct, and it will cause enzymes to leach in there and start to destroy the pancreas a little bit. So if you stop drinking, your pancreatitis goes away. I just deal with it. Tell me you followed that a little bit, yes? Okay, now watch. You need to know this anemone. You got me? What does the gallbladder do? And dehydrates it, right? So watch. There is the cystic duct, and then you have the common hepatic duct. The common hepatic duct drains the bile 
into the gallbladder. And then the common hepatic duct and the cystic duct come together to form the common bile duct. Are you with me? The common bile duct and the pancreatic duct come together to form that hepatopancreatic ampulla. And then you have a little sphincter muscle called the sphincter of Odie. Say it, Odie, Odie. Watch. Sometimes your gallbladder can't dehydrate your bile very well. So what you get is you start building up this bile sludge. You ever hear of a condition called hydrops? Never? Okay, forget about it. Here's my point. Watch. When do people get gallbladder attacks? What do you need bile for? To emulsify fat. So when do you think you would get a gallbladder attack? When you eat fat. And it's usually about 45 minutes, hour, maybe two hours after you eat a meal that's particularly high in fat. So watch. If you've got a big old gallstone, this thing's huge. When the gallbladder contracts, can this gallstone get through that cystic duct? No. So it lodges in there. Boom. And now you get a gallbladder attack. Say yes. And if it's bad enough, that gallbladder will start to inflame. And then they have to go in and take your gallbladder out. Most people don't survive that. Do you need your gallbladder to live? Yeah, you do. They don't take it out. Are you kidding me? It's a vital organ. It's connected to your liver. I mean, cut it out, right? Huh? They make a couple holes in you, right? And then they talk about their golf game and sew you back up. Then they show you like a gallbladder from a fish or maybe an octopus or something. Yeah, this is what we took out of you. Watch, this is a fact. If you get your gallbladder out at a young enough age, when they take your gallbladder out, the cystic duct can actually hypertrophy and form a small gallbladder. And if you get your gallbladder out early enough, you can get gallstones again. That's true. Did you know that? So reading the textbook reduces your risk for gallstones. Say yes. So you better know the function of the liver, you better know the function of the gallbladder, and you better know the function of digest or the pancreas in digestion. And not only that, if you look on Timmy YouTube videos, there's a video that says function of the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas in digestion. But don't look at that one. It will only tell you what you need to know. <sighs> Say yeah. Okay, here we go. Where's the vast majority of digestion and and absorption of nutrients, where does it occur? The small intestines. What are the three divisions of the small intestines? You better know that, like. Yep. Jejunum and ileum. Yep. Say what, uh huh? Um, an ileus, uh, that's a shortened version for what's called a paralytic ileus, where the ileus doesn't contract. And then basically, if it doesn't contract, you can't get the stuff. In. You got it. And they will start crapping or throwing up turds. I'm not even kidding. They will throw up stuff that looks just like turds and smells just like turds. Am I right? There you have it. So you don't want that. And one of the ways to avoid an alias is, of course, reading the textbook. Okay, hang on. I'm going to explain to you the lining of the small intestines. This is on your final. You know, for whatever reason, 
people get that question a lot. No, they get that when they pick the question. They get that question. Like for the last 10 years, I'm not even kidding. Bunch of, and you know what's weird too is that all you guys, when you picked your questions, there was all like a common, like everybody got like, what is an enzyme? Yeah. And I tell you to come in and shuffle the cards, and then when you leave, I shuffle the cards because I'm like, this is weird. But it happens every time, every time. I know. That's how interesting my life is, that I have something like that to talk about. <laughs> Don't hate. Hey, don't forget that nutrition class, the three-credit nutrition class that Tiffany Garrison is teaching. Take two of them. They're small. Huh? Oh, yeah. All right, here we go. Hey, do you remember from that cell? Do you remember from the cell? What are those uh, extensions of the cell membrane that increase the surface area for absorption? What is it? Microvilli, right? Millivanilli. What? Did somebody say it back there? Ahmed, did you say it? What? Where? No, the villi, microvilli? Oh. Okay. Watch. Don't this kind of look like a winter day in England where the snow's falling? No? Maybe it's just me. What you're looking at is the inside lining of the small intestine. You got me? Now, this is the fractal nature of the small intestine. No? Okay. Anyways, you see these little extensions right here? These are called plica. So they're like little fingers that increase the surface area for absorption. And they're found in the small intestines. Say yeah. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take a close-up view of one of those plica. That person was eating peas. You see that green stuff? There we go. Snowy day in England. It's raining peas. Beautiful. Summon up. There's Putin. Hang on. So, watch. This is called. Hang on. See what I do for you guys? All those problems with my computer? Thought I'd make this good for you. And you know what I get? Heartache. Yelling. Okay, here we go. This guy right here is called a villus. Better write that down. A villus contains an arterial and venous capillary. And as you can see, this little yellow thing that's embedded in that arterial capillary and venous capillary, this is a lymphatic vessel. And the lymphatic vessel, as we learned, is part of your circulatory system. And this is important when we talk about fat and cholesterol, and I'll explain it in a minute. So this lacteal, as you can see, it has these little things that look like little kiwi seeds, right? These are individual cells that cover the lacteal. And those individual cells that cover that lacteal have further elevations of their cell membrane called microvilli. So do you see this? Do you see this? 
So this right here, those extensions, those are the microvilli. So if we take this back just a bit, you have the villus, then you have the individual cells, and those individual cells have further extensions of the cell membrane called microvilli. Who's with me? That's the fractile nature, and that really increases the surface area for absorption. Now, this is the important piece, and this is what you have to get. For the entire semester, I've been explaining to you that enzymes are located inside the cell, right? Now, watch. In the small intestines, it's different. Where's your food? Your food is in the black hole of Calcutta here, right? This is where the lumen of the stomach is. This is where you eat food. This is where it gets into. So where do you want the digestive enzymes? You want the digestive enzymes embedded in the membrane of the microvilli so that the food is actually exposed to those enzymes, these digestive enzymes. Who cares what they are right now? Now, watch. I don't know if anyone's ever, any of you guys gone on like a radical diet for a while, right, where you cut out like specific foods. Have you ever done that? Yeah. When you cut out specific foods in your diet, your digestive system will say, look, this person ain't eating this stuff anymore, so I'm not going to make those digestive enzymes, and you'll stop making them. Now, if you try going back to eating that stuff, you will actually kind of feel sick because you don't have the enzymes to break that food down. So what you eat will actually determine the type of enzymes that are placed in the villi of those small intestines. And if you alter the way you eat, you will alter those enzymes. Now, some people develop situations where they don't have a specific enzyme. Like, for example, if you're lactose intolerant, you lack the enzyme lactase. So you can't digest the sugar that's found in milk and dairy products. Say, yeah. And if you don't have that enzyme, you can't digest it, and that food goes intact from your small intestines into your large intestines. How many people are following that? You got that. Make sense? So watch, and this is what I want from you. So embedded in the microvilli of the cells that make up the small intestines are specific digestive enzymes, and they begin to digest your food. What are enzymes made of? Please get this right. Protein, right? And you don't know this yet, but I'm going to tell you this right now. Protein contains sulfur. And the lining of your GI tract turns over every three to five days. So what happens in addition to you crapping out your, you know, cream of wheat, you are actually crapping out the sloughed off cells of your small intestines. And those enzymes go with it, and they contain sulfur. I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. How many people got this? You're following this. Now, this is what I want from you. Those enzymes, hang on. Someone up. See, watch. Those enzymes, you're going to digest carbs, bless you, and protein. And the carbs and protein that you digest gets absorbed into the venous end of that villus. So when you eat something that has sugar in it or protein in it, those get digested and then immediately absorbed into the venous end of the villus. Fat and cholesterol are different. Fat and cholesterol 
do not get absorbed into the bloodstream. Fat and cholesterol, when they're digested, they get absorbed into the lymphatic system. Fat and cholesterol get absorbed into the lymphatic system. Where do all the veins of the body dump their venous blood? Right side of the heart. All lymph vessels, I'm going to write this down, all lymph vessels dump their lymph into the right side of the heart. So how many people have had to go to the doctor and get a fasting blood draw? How long did they tell you you have to fast? So how long? 12 hours, right? So watch, watch. If you eat food that has fat and cholesterol in it, from the time you digest it and it gets absorbed into the lymphatic system, it takes 10 hours for it to show up in your bloodstream. So when they tell you to fast 10 to 12 hours, they don't want you having Burger King that night before and that's showing up in your bloodstream. That's why you have to fast at minimum 10 to 12 hours. So the stuff that you ate the night before, the fat and cholesterol, doesn't show up in your bloodstream. And it makes sense. Does your brain give a rat's hydrocephalic fatty acid what your triglyceride and cholesterol levels are? Does it? Why? Nice. You could, the brain only cares about what your sugar level is because the brain only uses sugar. So it doesn't care that it takes 10 to 12 hours for fat and cholesterol to get into your blood. All it cares about is that your blood sugar goes up right away. That's why carbs and amino acids are absorbed directly into the bloodstream and fat and cholesterol take their fatty acid time about getting into the blood. Say yes. That's why that's important. All right. So... That, ladies and gentlemen, is the lining of the small intestines. And you better tell me about the specificity of enzymes, yes, and where fat, protein, and um, cholesterol and carbs are absorbed. What part? And where do all the veins of the body dump their venous blood from the GI tract? The liver. So everything goes through the liver on the way in through the hepatic portal vein. Say yes. Okay, we're doing really good. We're almost done. Then you can ambulate. Anybody actually going to ambulate home? I don't think so, right? Look at this. Okay, watch. There's something in this room, man. Is there? No, do you feel it? No, do you, like, are you itchy? Anybody itchy? I hope it's not uh, carbon monoxide because I'm getting out first. <laughs> okay, wait. Um, hang on. Okay. So I'm gonna, man, I cannot get this together. This is really irritating me. Okay. Watch. So the vast majority of digestion and absorption of nutrients occurs where? In the small intestines. Now, you don't know this yet, but I'm going to tell you anyways, that the small intestines have a huge, huge lymphatic supply. And we're going to learn about this that the lymphatic system is intimately involved in your immune system. And your immune system protects you. So when that food is digested, it is also cleaned of any bad stuff. So the food or the partially digested food that remains in your small intestines is sterile. You got me? So what? now this is important. Whatever's left over from your small intestines that wasn't digested and absorbed in your small intestines, there is, you separate clean and dirty. So there is a valve that separates the ileum from 
the first part of your large intestines, and that valve is called the L E O C G O valve, and that valve prevents any dirty stuff in the large intestines from coming into the small intestines, and vice versa. You got me? All right. So watch. Where are we? Boom. I got it. Here we go. Here's the large intestines. Does the large intestines release digestive enzymes? Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> no, you, you're a trick. <laughs> so stupid. There's no digestive enzymes in the lining of the large intestines. So does digestion occur in the large intestines? Better get this. Large intestines, dirty, nasty, <coughs> poop stinks. Write that down. That's because there are, on average, 700 different bacteria that live in your colon. They are called normal biota or normal flora. They live a synergistic, symbiotic relationship with you. You give them a place to live and a big screen TV. And they help you by digesting the food that was left over from the small intestines. And they also make vitamins for you. Riboflavin, thiamine, say yes. So that's why you hear on GNC, take probiotics. So you take this stuff and it grows healthy bacteria in your gut. How many people got healthy bacteria in your gut? Nobody? I do. That's right, man. Me, yeah, me and Maya, right? Our colons are straight. Okay, so watch. That's why antibiotics cause diarrhea. When you take antibiotics, it jacks with the balance between the bacteria, and some bad bacteria will start winning. They'll start producing toxins and produce diarrhea. That's why you don't do that. Study. Tell me you got that. And depending on your colon will determine what bacteria you have. So if you've been good, you got good bacteria. Been bad, got bad bacteria. You with me? Better write this down because it's on the final. The primary function of the large intestine is to absorb water and electrolytes and to digest the undigested food from the small intestines. And what does the digesting? Bacteria. Bacteria have the same metabolic machinery that we do. Do you know that? They got mitochondria and Golgi apparatus. So when you eat, watch, if you eat corn, and you don't have the enzymes to digest it. Where does that corn end up? In your large intestines. Does the bacteria have the digestive enzymes to break that down? So it will break it down and it will produce carbon dioxide and methane. That's why fiber makes you gassy. And methane, when ignited, produces a blue flame. How many people have ever lit their farts on fire? Anybody? No? Guys think farting's funny. Women don't. I told you what I did to my girl, right? You know what? It would have been a perfect plan if I would have had a mattress cover. Uh, like 10 years ago. Anyway, real quick. So it was in the summertime, right? And I got my air conditioning on. And then 
I'm driving down um, 52nd Street in Kenosha, and then I get to the stoplight, and there was this old lady, right, sitting next to me. And then I fart, right, so I roll down the window, and then she rolled down the window, too, and I go, did you fart, too? (laughs) (laughs) And in the wintertime, those things, man, they got some serious hang time. (laughs) Right, because of the cold, it doesn't dissipate it. I went and got um, donuts at, like, 6.30 in the morning on a Sunday. Then I had to take my girl to, like, I don't know, a store in the afternoon. And she gets in, and she's like, whoa, what happened? It had that much hang time. That's all right. Okay, fine. If you write a paper on farts, I'll give you extra credit. (laughs) Okay, watch. Remember I told you that the large intestines don't have, it's not solid muscle like the small intestines, yes? So they have these little outpoochings. These little outpoochings are called hostra. And because they don't have a lot of muscle, watch it, as people age, they can get weakening of that wall of the large intestines. And a weakening of the wall of the large intestine is called a diverticulum. Have you ever heard of that? Never heard of diverticulum? You've heard of diverticulitis? Yeah, that's an infection of that. Say so, yeah. And you better know the divisions of the large intestines. The first part of the large intestines is called the cecum. Then you have the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon. And then you have the rectum, which is the kind of the little storage area right, where you can sit there and brew it for a while. Anyways, now watch. Hang on, we're almost done. We did good today. In the rectum, you have two sphincters. You have an internal sphincter that's under autonomic control, and then you have an external sphincter that's under conscious control, right? You don't want to be lifting your leg and just blowing, right? So when you start increasing pressure of poop in the rectum, that is going to stimulate the internal sphincter to relax. So with little kids, right, they're playing with their Lincoln Logs, right, and all of a sudden that internal sphincter relaxes and they're like, Right, and then you, then you see him running behind the couch, and then I go, "What are you doing?" I'm pooping. Yeah, you need home field advantage, kids. They need home. Field, they hold on to that crap for like ten hours. They ain't crapping in those little bathrooms at school. They're gonna run, ambulate home, and crap in their toilet. Right? They need that home. Who doesn't though? I know it's your place. Tell me you got that. All right. Now watch. Just real quick, and then we can end it here. And you'll want to end it right here. <laughs> when you go, right, you got to relax. <laughs> yeah, relax. Right, you can't be tense because that's, well, we'll talk about that. But anyways, when you go, um, what people think is they're done, right? And then you get what's called a like the second wave. So you wipe, and any time you stimulate the external sphincter, that stimulates peristalsis. Then you get what's called the second wave. Then you got to go again. Bam. You ever get that? No one will admit that. On the final, if you did, admit it. Uh, t- the reason I bring that up, watch. Um, people who are paraplegic or quadriplegic, uh, can they poop on their own? No. So how you create peristalsis in someone who is paraplegic or quadriplegic is you will give them an emina, right, um, or a suppository, which all it does is stimulate or irritate the colon wall to stimulate peristalsis, and then glove, KY, and then you stimulate the external sphincter, and that will stimulate peristalsis. That's a bowel program. Isn't that lovely? Okay, that's enough for today. Um, make sure that I, uh, um, let's see, what's today? Okay, Tuesday, uh, you're going to work in labs, uh, so bring your stuff, yes? And then um, also if you uh, 
look, there is a, a video on digestion called uh, Completely Digesting the Hamburger, and it takes you from the mouth all the way down. Say yeah, so you can take a look at that, and then boom. Uh, on what? No, that ain't going to be on the final. Uh, print off that final, yeah? And then do me a favor, make sure that you turn in your um, multiple guests. <coughs> What's that? Oh, the multiple guests for what? Oh, yeah, you make a million dollars. Probably would. You know, I never even thought about that. <laughs>